Our next speaker, Professor Peter Borschberg, is an associate professor at the department at NU, the history department at NUS. His uh, specialization is Europe-Asia interaction between the 15th and 20th centuries, focusing on such themes as trade, exploration, globalization, and historic cartography. In addition to the books 700 Years and Studying Singapore Before 1800, Professor Borschberg has compiled and published a number of never-before-seen sources on pre-colonial Singapore from non-English European archives. Please join me in welcoming Professor Peter Borschberg to the stage. I feel like one of these Microsoft executives at the moment, <clears throat> equipped with, with microphone and all. <clears throat> First, I'd like to thank uh, Matthew and his team for having me here today, and thank you all for taking time out to listen to what I have to say. And as Monty Python used to say, and now for something completely different. <laughs> I'm going to pull you back in time. I'm going to take you to the period before 1800, and we're going to look at what sources in general we have to reconstruct the history of Singapore and the region at large. Now, I, I admit that I work mainly with European sources. Um, I, no, 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 I, I do. And I am, I hear uh, Professor Alatas loud and clear. <laughs> but as you will find out in a moment, uh, there, there are lots of problems, and uh, it's one thing to have evidence and materials in front of you that we use as historians. It's a very different thing to interpret these, uh, as I will uh, explain in a few minutes. So let me just give you an overview. I'm going to limit this to five points. And I just want to remind you that I'm going to be speaking about sources and types of sources in general. And I'm not going to specifically distinguish between European and Asian sources. If you want to discuss particular sets of sources with me, I'll be happy to discuss them with you. But now I'm just trying to go through in a very basic way what we have in front of us. So, let me begin by saying, how has the writing of pre-1800 history of Singapore based on the texts evolved over the decades? I have deliberately here excluded uh, the archaeological finds for the time being because that has been covered by my esteemed uh, colleague. Then, different types of sources and some of the personal conclusions that I have drawn from using them over the past three decades. I also want to say something just about how difficult it is to handle pre-1800 materials. And the sources aren't always very clear what they're saying or what they're trying to say. This is another obstacle that we face. The challenge as historians that we have is to bring this to the attention and into the public consciousness of the general public of people like yourselves. And this, frankly, is earlier said, uh, is, is easier said than done, as you will hear in, in just a few minutes. Let me begin with the first point, which is how has the history writing of Singapore based on text for the period before 1800 changed. When I embarked on this endeavor in the 1990s, I was told by my then head of department that, well, go ahead, you won't find much. It's, you know, you can probably count the sources on one hand. That was the tone. And with hindsight, I have to say, the advice given to me was well intended, but also typical of the sort of biases that were there about what was available. And there are three areas that I can identify here. The first is 
my head of department followed the British tradition that claiming nothing happened on Singapore from, say, 1300 until Raffles arrived in 1819. Or, as I tell my students all the time, you know, Raffles landed in 1819, and before that, dinosaurs roamed the earth. The second point, or second assumption that they made, is that Singapore was mainly known as Tomasic or Singapore, and so people would, in various places, in the libraries and, and archives, they would start looking for references to these and say, have you, have you found anything on, on, on Tomasic yet? Have you, have you found anything? Um, and, uh, well, that's also a problem. It's not always known by that name. It, carries different names across time. And, of course, the crowning part of all of this is the best and most reliable sources to process are those in the Strait Settlements records, those English East India or British East India Company institutional records. Now, that's where you go look for the history of Singapore. And of course, I say all three of these assumptions are highly problematic. Ah, that was too far. Okay. There we go. The bias, just to elaborate on that last point, had always been to focus on the English language sources and to dismiss anything, really, European and Asian languages, that did not fit into this particular template. But clearly, historians in Singapore working in the 50s and 60s and even the 70s were clearly aware that, of course, there, there must be other things out there other than in English. It's just that it wasn't particularly encouraged to look. It was seen as futile, huh? as I had been told. Yeah, you can go look, but it's futile to go, and you're not going to find anything meaningful. And so it took a while to, for myself to overcome these biases that had been conveyed to me at a very early stage. Hussein, Syed Hussein Alatas was certainly aware that there were other materials out there. We know that he liberally drew on Dutch sociologists and also Dutch sources, Van der Kemp, for example, who talked about the problems of founding Singapore from a Dutch point of view. Or Harry Marx, who in the 1950s wrote about the period from 1819 to 1824, mainly based on Dutch materials, and as a result came up with a very different point of view, not as rosy and positive about Raffles as the English language sources had it. And so the <clears throat> English language bias that we're so used to is really epitomized by Mary Turnbull's History of Singapore, published in 1975, where she uses predominantly and almost exclusively English archival materials. And that gave a different perspective on Singapore's history than we would otherwise get looking at a broader range of sources. Studying Singapore before 1800, which I co-edited with uh, Kwa Chung Wan, who sits here in the front row and who you heard earlier today, uh, we, we put together a series of articles representing efforts made in the 1940s, even, even 30s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and even to the 60s of trying to uncover Singapore's earlier history from European and Asian sources, including Chinese sources, yeah? Uh, Xi Yun Xiao's uh, articles, for example, were heavily drawing on, on the Ming Chronicles, for example. And in his masterly introduction, 
he came to the rather unsurprising conclusion that 1965 and all that kind of threw the spanner into the works of these efforts to uncover Singapore's history before 1800, because the country, as a newly independent state, was taking a very different trajectory, and there were suddenly new realities forced on them that also changed the way the country was looking at its own history. It was beginning no longer to see it as an integral part of the peninsular um, history, <coughs> but one as an independent or separate state. Let me now go to point two, and we'll talk about specifically the different kinds of sources at hand. Um, the most helpful sources, to me at least, for the pre-1800 period have all been uh, in non-English language uh, mediums. Um, they range from Asian languages, Malay and Chinese, which I have to sometimes consult in translation myself, uh, to the European vernaculars, which I'm much better at mastering uh, on my own and do not require necessarily a translation, although they can be very helpful sometimes. The evidence at hand that we have from this period is comparatively sparse. It is not the same as later periods in the 19th century. And so really, we cannot be too picky with what we have. Uh, they are what they are, and we have to use what we have in front of us. And this really pushes us in a direction to also not just look at you know, formal and informal types of materials, but also to look at non-conventional sources. I have here uh, listed a couple of those. Historic cartography, both from the Western and from the Eastern tradition. Um, historic glossaries and handbooks. Uh, there is a Western tradition for this, but there is also a long and very important tradition in the Chinese world and in Western Asian cultures as well, the Persians and the Arabs, for example. At literature, literature may not be historical fact, but literature can be an expression of a, well, zeitgeist, a, a spirit of the age. People's fears and hopes and aspirations can be expressed in literature. And finally, sketchbooks like the one I have here. Um, there are, a picture can literally be worth a thousand words. This I have here is a street scene from uh, Java somewhere in the year 1660. And it's actually very good and very surprisingly detailed. Uh, this is done by uh, uh, a, a Dutch sketcher who was a uh, officer uh, aboard one of the vessels. When we look at the conventional sources, what are we looking at here? When we look at the con conventional sources, we look mainly at these conventional um, standard government institutional documentation, uh, colonial government reports, uh, missionary reports, uh, diplomatic correspondence, treaties, that sort of thing. Legal documents and formal agreements can also be part of both a, a formal as well as a non-formal source of history. And, and the question is, well, what about the Chinese court chronicles? Is, is, is that public? Is that, is that something that was um, more confidential? Those are, those are a bit more iffy, uh, how we want to categorize those. And then we have a set of materials that was, well, let's call it publicly available. So in a European context, that would have meant, what could you, as a person, with a bit of resourcefulness, do to find it, let's say, in the university library, or if you went to a ducal palace library and started foraging in there, or a monastery. 
What could you possibly find? These were mostly printed sources, but sometimes they were copies of manuscripts as well. As much to be found. I have put here something that has nothing to do with Singapore, but just to show you that even today, you can find important sources. This was only recently discovered. It's a letter by the Burmese king from the year uh, 1756 and was discovered in Germany recently. Um, it was there all along, probably sitting there in the catalog, but nobody really paid attention to what it was. And it is uh, now a UNESCO um, heritage artifact. Um, because it is one of the only surviving golden letters that were known to have been written uh, by the Burmese rulers, uh, surviving with beautiful uh, ruby um, adornment. Non-conventional sources are also very important. When we look at this, we have, as said, historic cartography, both from the Eastern and the Western tradition. Uh, we have specifically for uh, the Singapore Straits, we have the Mao Kun map, but there are other examples as well. I remember watching with sheer, or staring with sheer uh, joy uh, in Korea in the National Museum, at the maps hanging on the wall there that were from the 15th century, uh, done mainly in the Mongol tradition. Very interesting and very informative. Uh, we have those glossaries and handbooks. Material culture is probably the last one we should look at. Now, we have archaeology as material culture as well. I'm not necessarily talking about what you dig out of the ground now. I'm talking about what your great-great-grandparents had acquired maybe when they got married and uh, had, you know, acquired and passed down to the heirs. In other words, physical artifacts that are not necessarily archeological finds, um, but they can tell us about what had meaning to these people. Paintings, pieces of furniture, uh, stained glass windows, right? And what gave them comfort. How many and what quality are they? I have personally seen, let's say, a couple of hundred of them, right? That's probably an underestimation of how many I've actually seen. I've processed recently in a publication over 400 printed books touching on Singapore and the region. And what we have in these published and unpublished sources is anything between a couple of pages and just a few words. The reality is, ladies and gentlemen, that those that are more substantial, right, let's say a paragraph or more, or even a sentence or more, are really quite rare already. You can eliminate at least 80 to 90 percent of the sources that are at least one sentence long, eh? referencing Singapore. It doesn't mean that the short ones aren't important, they are. The author's first-hand experience is often a real critical aspect in this, because, and education level, because it's difficult to put things into writing, especially if you're on the move and on the go. These people who are traveling on ships weren't necessarily educated persons. They were often barely literate, and that's exactly how they write. They write like your five-year-old boy who came back from the zoo that day, you know? <laughs> so what did you, what did you see today? Oh, we saw this, and we saw this, oh, and we had an ice cream, and, and this, 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 and that. That's exactly how they write. No depth, no critical engagement, just a pearl necklace with factoids put together. They're problematic, I admit, because what are you going to do with a statement like, oh, and we pass by and there were natives standing on the beach? 
Is that historically relevant? Well, maybe that there were people on the island, yes, but they may not have been permanent dwellers, we don't know. We don't know who these people were, but they were there standing on the beach, that's all we know. Pre-1800 sources are notoriously difficult to handle. Look, the past is a foreign country, and the farther back you go in time, the more difficult it becomes to understand what it was that they wanted to say or achieve with a text or a paragraph or an image. It's difficult, and it takes experience. And for those of you who aspire to make a contribution in the future, I have some news. You're gonna need some ancillary skills in all of this. The most important is paleography, if you are looking at manuscripts, and epigraphy, if you're looking at stone inscriptions. And let me tell you what some of this stuff looks like. I recall, as a young postgraduate student in Cambridge, looking at handwritten documents from the 17th century. And let me tell you, everything looked like it was written on a moving cart on a dirt road. <laughs> and then, there was no standardized spelling at that point in time. Right? So you have to phonetically reconstruct by reading it out time and over and over again until you actually suss out what word this was. We can't afford to be too picky because in the end, when it comes down to really informative materials, there is not much out there, admittedly. Not, not compared to the 19th century, no, but certainly more than the handful of sources that had been predicted uh, in, in uh, the early 90s to me. It's difficult to decode what is being said. I'm showing you this map here uh, by Manuel Godinho de Radia, a Eurasian engineer, adventurer, and cartographer who lived in Malacca in the, uh, ter at the turn of the 16th and 17th century. He was the uh, son of a uh, Aragonese, so Spanish nobleman, and a daughter of the king of Supa on the island of Sulawesi. And this is from his unpublished sketchbook, which only exists in photograph form today. And I've been familiar, this is only a part of it, huh? I've been familiar with this for many, many years, but it took me a while to figure out what on earth he's trying to say with this. This is actually an economic and resource map of the Malay Peninsula. Now, when you first look at it, you wouldn't guess. In reality, it's very complex and multi-layered because he tells you where there are deposits of things, mining operations going on, you know, supervised by uh, the, one of the uh, Shabandars of Johor. Um, those lines, dotted lines, are actually overland trails, so there are overland trails uh, along which cargo moved, and the interesting thing is they're all on the eastern side of the peninsula, not on the west. The sources aren't always clear what they reference. Now, I sat down and thought to myself, okay, so the word Singapura, and it's about 50 different spelling variants um, and garbled renditions. What does it and can it all mean? It can mean a settlement, an island, one of two straits, a river, a bay, a polity, or a kingdom a hinterland, a promontory or a cape, a mountain ridge, or any combination of these. 
A few days ago, I got very excited because the State Library in Munich sent me uh, this map here you see on the right uh, in reproduction. And I, got, I was immediately smiling because I said, oh, this is, this is fantastic. This is actually the southern tip of the Malay Peninsula, believe it or not. You wouldn't recognize it necessarily as such. Oops, that didn't go well. Uh, no. Here we go. Uh, this is the light, is it? Yeah. So this is a, a trans-peninsular waterway which doesn't exist. It's simply a rendition of an, uh, an overland riverine route, which they thought was a through passage, but is not. The second route only exists in certain specimens of French cartography, so this may say where this is actually coming from. Now, I'm not putting this here to show you the fake trans-peninsular waterways. They're interested in their own right. I'm saying it because the name Singapore appears here as Rio de Singapura. It appears here as Cabo de Singapura, the Cape of Singapore. It's here, Isla de Singapura, the island of Singapore. Then there's Baia de Singapura, the Bay of Singapore. <laughs> And here is a little town here, there, depicted with some houses. That obviously is the settlement of Singapore. So what you have here on this thing is really good because it's already showing you that the name can refer to different things. Now, you're reading in a text, and the ship arrived from Singapore. But what does this mean? Does it come from the river, the bay, the polity, the hinterland? Probably not. The promontory, the cape? Probably not the mountain ridge, the settlement, or the island? We don't know. And, and this is it. This is the problem. Even if you have a name that you can pin down and identify, it is not always clear what it is referencing. And this is not unique to Singapore. We have the same problem when we talk about Malacca. What does Malacca mean? Malacca be, can be a town, it can be a river, it can be a settlement, it can be uh, a polity, a hinterland, and it can be the entire Malay Peninsula, you know, all known as Malacca. So things are very ambiguous. The problem, the next problem we face is that a lot of these sources offer a collage of information. Now, I put here a collage for those of you who are weak in imagination and can't remember having done a collage in school, right? They're little pieces of paper or, or cloth that you, you know, put together. So you have little snippets of information, and you put it together in a way that actually creates something completely new that wasn't there before. And so what we have in these early sources is they take and pick whatever they could find, which was jolly little, and then they put it into a form that, well, is hardly recognizable anymore. So information is a collage. There's also mindless copying going on, yeah? They already did that, not just our students. Yeah, they did mindless copying out of, out of books and other books, and, and with them, of course, the mindless copying out of errors as well. So this is how errors got perpetuated. Often in cartography, this is an important point. And this is true both of Western as well as Asian sources. This is not a phenomenon that is unique to the Western sources. All right, folks. So we've done this. We've looked at what we have. We realize that there's a problem with it. We realize that we, it's not always clear, and we're looking for meaning. Because here's the problem. When we deal with these sources, we have to, as historians, do something with them that is meaningful and accessible to a wider public. And in my opinion, that is the biggest challenge of all. All these ancillary things is one thing. Making it accessible to a contemporary audience, that is a bit more tricky. Reaching out 
to a general audience, there are many challenges that have to be overcome. Let me just give you some of the examples over the last 30 years of what I have experienced presenting before people just like you. The first one is, I've never heard of that. You made that all up. Yeah? New evidence can be very alienating. Yeah? How come nobody's ever told me this before? You made this up. Uh -huh. Then you begin to quote chapter and verse, and you say, oh, well, you need to look at this source and that source and, and the other one. And then they say, I can't read it. I don't know how to read Persian, or I don't know how to read Portuguese. So, folks, next problem, you have to be able to translate it and present it to the general reader in such a way that they will understand that source as well and make it accessible. Because there's no point in publishing in these top, 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 top journals with the top, top, top publishers if you don't make it accessible. It's just, it's pointless. It really is. And my favorite, and I had this just a few days ago, oh, prof, I found something. And I'm like, oh, did you now? What did you find? And they said, yeah, yeah, I found a reference in a book from that, and it says Singapore in here. And I said, yeah. So what Singapore is it referencing? Is it the town, the cape, the strait, the whatever? What, what is being referenced here? So just because you find the name doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a very meaningful discovery in the end that really translates into a great insight. And so I come to the end, close to it, of my presentation. And you may ask, well, what's coming next on my side? Well, let me tell you this. I have finished up several projects. One co-written with my former student, Benjamin Koo. This was a side project when we set out to look at references to Singapore in the pre-modern period, mainly from, from Western literature, we came to the conclusion that there are so many hundreds of glossary and dictionary and geographic handbook references that this really needs a separate discussion on its own. So we did this in this little booklet called Knowing Singapore, the evolution of published information. So this is what you could have found in 1800, had you gone into a library in, in Europe, for example, right? And this would have included probably some non-European languages as well. Mapping Singapore before 1800 has been my nightmare of the last 25 years. Uh, yes, it's come to an end. I have, I have submitted the final product this past week, so um, you can akam uh, datang, huh? Uh, as they used to say in the cinemas. And archiving Singapore before 1800, I reckon that will be done sometime early next year. That is a, an anthology of translated materials from non-English sources. So what can we say to sum it all up here? First of all, it's crucial to broaden your horizons beyond the English language. That seems about as obvious now as telling me that water is wet or that my mother is a woman, okay? <laughs> Two, tech sources are varied in different lengths and depths, and references that are substantial are not very many, not very many that are substantial, usually very short but they can still be meaningful. Sources to look at include conventional texts, documents, transcripts, travel literature, geographies, eh? as well as non-conventional materials, historic cartography, material artifacts, um, uh, sketches, diaries, um, literature, right? Literature would also be uh, an important point in all of this. Um, not all 
of the materials contain original materials. Yes, there was lots of cutting and pasting and copying going on already in the pre-modern era, so uh, beware huh, of copying out or you know, falling for information that is misguided. And finally, the challenge that we have, ladies and gentlemen, once we have all this evidence in front of us, is finding a way of engaging with it meaningfully with a contemporary audience in Singapore and the region. That means asking all sorts of questions. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been a great audience. Thank you so much for your attention. Hello, and uh, thank you for this insightful talk. Um, it's very refreshing to see those unconventional research methods. I just wanted to ask um, if you can share with us like um, one of your biggest um, surprises or you know, some major discoveries that you have made that way. I'm going to buy your book and read your book, but maybe as a teaser. <laughs> Stories about, about going into weird places. I mean, I love going into weird and off-the-mark off the places. I guess I could tell you um, about 20 years ago, I had read somewhere in a Portuguese book that there was a document written about extensive report in letter form written by the commanding officer, Paulo de Lima, to Philip II of Spain, how he destroyed Johor Lama. Very long report. And I wanted to see that report. And it said that this was in El Escorial Palace outside Madrid. So one February, I went out to Madrid. And I froze there in the antechamber at uh, about minus 20 degrees. Uh, it was in February. And I came to the library, and this library was straight out of the name of the rose. <laughs> really, because when I said, okay, here, uh, you know, I have this, this reference here, and, and, and the librarian looked at me, and he looked at the publication, he says, no, no existe, doesn't exist. I said, oh, come on, you know, I have just traveled 10,000 kilometers to get here, you know, you, you know could, could you at least have a look? He's like, no, no doesn't exist. He said, I tell you what, I'll get my predecessor, right? The, the retired father librarian of the Augustinian order, and he came down on a walker. Huh? And I explained the whole thing to him again, and I said, well, what about it? He said, no. <laughs> no. But he had a really good piece of advice. He said, you know, Here's what you can do, possibly. He said, you know, there's another collection of Philip II's letters in another palace in Madrid, in the in, in inner city. Um, and you may want to go there and have a look. He says, that's really the only advice I have. I mean, it may be there and at the back of his mind in the 1920s, this, this, this Portuguese author just confused the two palaces uh, that he had been to. And lo and behold, thank goodness, that's where I found it. Thank you. So just remember, librarians are your friends. <laughs> Hello, uh, yes, hi, I'm Kareen. I, I just recently graduated with a degree in history from Yale and US College. Uh, I think my question for you is, just like you mentioned that Singapore and Singapura in its many variations can mean a lot of different things in text. Uh, but sometimes in like discussions, uh, terms like Southeast Asia can actually mean a lot of things. Is it the people? Is it the region? Is it a political entity? Mm. So I think that that's my first question, which is what do you see as Southeast Asia? What do you define as Southeast Asia? And my second question is, 
do what is the value of say studying Singapore on its own versus studying it within the flows of say the broader region of the, the broader region and also the world? Okay, so thank you for that question. What is the point of studying Singapore history on its own? I never do that. I think that if you even go on to chat GPT, it will tell you that I don't do that. <laughs> huh? I, never, I never look at the history of Singapore on its own. I always look at the history of Singapore as part of the region, because in the early modern period, Singapore is part of something else. It always is, right? It's part of Johor. It is part of the Malacca polity, and so on and so forth. So I never do that, so I, I hope I've answered that for you. Where is Southeast Asia? That's a really good question. Answer. Southeast Asia as a concept is fairly modern. Comes from the World War II theater. Yet, yet, <laughs> there are older geographical concepts, um, especially in European cartography, that might indicate something along those lines. In Portuguese, you would refer to island, insular Southeast Asia as Insulindia, for example. There, they're, they're talking about Insulindia, then you know they're talking about the islands. Um, in Dutch and German cartography of the 17th and 18th century, they refer to the Malay Peninsula as the peninsula beyond the Ganges. So that would be, right? Um, and then you have something called Farther India, right? So that would be the peninsula beyond the Ganges, and that would be mainly referred to mainland Southeast Asia. So is it? Yes, it exists, but they're different concepts, and they mean different things at different time. And believe me, you need to be very aware of all of this, right? Um, what does a word mean at that point in time? Especially geographic concepts, they're really tricky. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Wolfberg. That's all, folks? That is all, so round of applause, please. <laughs> <laughs>